Hi. So very, very warm welcome. It is my pleasure and delight to be hosting this Q&A today with the author of Breaking Together, Professor Jem Bendal. Today marks the launch of the free ebook version of Jem's new book, Breaking Together. And it's released today to coincide with the 50th anniversary of the publication Small is Beautiful by E.F. Schumacher, which is appropriate because Jem's book is published by the Schumacher Institute. And so recognising uh, that lineage, that heritage. Professor Jem Bendel is best known for his viral paper on climate change called Deep Adaptation, which was released almost uh, five years ago now. And the influence of that paper on the growth, the early growth of Extinction Rebellion. He formerly worked for the UN, for WWF, and for many corporations on sustainability issues before shifting five years ago to focus on adaptation to unfolding societal disruption and even collapse. So we're joined here by uh, by people who are who have been. Some people who have been following and supporting and influenced by Jem's work uh, since since before the uh, publication of the Deep Adaptation paper, um, yeah, and those who have who have joined the Deep Adaptation forum and have come across his work from from elsewhere. So it's really really great pleasure uh, to be here with you all and um, Jem. Thanks for joining. Thanks for all you do. How are you? Thank you, Katie. Um, so I was a bit nervous. This is the first online Q and A uh, that I'm doing about the book, and I say that it might actually be the only one I'm going to do. Um, uh, but seeing very familiar faces, and also this format, which I know quite well, uh, in the sort of the and emphasizing deep adaptation and, and a q and a a dialogue i'm having some nostalgia so uh, feeling feeling good to be here thank you yeah nostalgia here as well having um having accompanied you uh through the deep adaptation forum in in part of this journey so um you've spent two the last two and a half years researching and writing breaking together um and it is quite a weighty tome i haven't quite finished it i have been um the the epub is available but the audio book is also available on audible and i have been kind of jumping between the two and taking um i have found taking breaks in in between so it's a, it's a, it's a powerful book it's a powerful message uh, I'm wondering what you hope that the impact of this book is going to be. So I had to plug in my headphones as I got a message that my uh, audio wasn't loud enough. So I missed the back end of your question because I was. Yeah. Uh, so please just repeat that. Sure. The question is, what do you hope that the impact of this book is going to be? Ah. Uh -huh. Yeah, and you mentioned the time it took to do it. So, wow. So the my intention for this book is completely different from when I started on this project. So two and a half years ago, I got funded by a foundation with the when the idea was about how do we bring more people into a conversation about societal disruption and collapse? And when I say more people, there was an interest from the funder and me at the time about more sort of senior ranking people in civil society, business, government, international organizations, and so on. And uh, because it had been quite a taboo subject, and then when it, when it had exploded, it had sort of been effectively uh, demonized in mainstream media. And yet we knew so many people uh, who it was their sort of their personal, private, secret truth that publicly they would talk about um, technological change and uh, market mechanisms and hope, 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 we can do this. And privately, uh, they, they, they were scared, and, but they also didn't know how to talk about their private truth publicly. And so the original idea was 
I was going to do research that would help me write a book which would help more senior leaders engage in this professionally and publicly. However, as we, I, I work with a team of people in a variety of different disciplines, and over time, I discovered that actually maybe my deep adaptation paper and I, ideas and framing wasn't radical enough because I discovered that actually uh, there's a good case to make that society, modern societies, industrial consumer societies, had already started to break down since around 2015 and, um, and that there are already a lot of regressive responses underway from authorities, basically panicked authorities, and I discovered there's a lot of psychology and sociology on why that happens. Uh, and so suddenly I was discovering sort of more of a anti-elitist, anti-authoritarian uh, sentiment that I wanted to communicate. I really wanted to um, help people who were a bit suspicious of how global elites were responding to the growing sense of crisis. Uh, I wanted to share that there's a different way we don't have to just rely on billionaires and technology and senior bosses to somehow come to the rescue. In fact, that's not going to work. And so the book was has become about a people's environmentalism, a freedom-loving response to the situation uh, as a result of all, all that, my own journey over the last two and a half years. Um, so what do I want from the imp impact? I... I don't actually care about senior leaders uh, res responding positively to this agenda or this book. Um, my aim is quite different now. I'm wanting to help affirm the, the doubts, suspicious, suspicions of a lot of activists, um, a lot of people who want to see a, a more collaborative, dialogic, uh, response to what's going on, um, and I, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm actually quite excited about um, how some, so for example, some of the co-founders of, of Extinction Rebellion are responding, and other people who I, I know quite well. Uh, it's, it's, it's. I think it's really helping, uh, helping them uh, understand what's going on. Thank you. You're um, not an uncontroversial figure. That's double negatives. Yeah, you you haven't shied away from um, from speaking truth. Um, and there is a really, really uh, there, there's a really strong message. The book I have really, really appreciated. So particularly some of the parts. I think it's some of your most powerful writing that I've read so far. So well done. Um, and there is also there's a kind of ferocity in this book. Um, you did mention that you've uh, some of the um, positive response, particularly from the from some of the founders from Extinction Rebellion. But I'm wondering about um, yeah more more broadly, how is it being received so far? Do you feel like it's it's hitting where you want it to? Uh, yeah, landing where you want it to land. Yeah, um, I'm really excited about how it seems to be uh, a shot in the arm in a good way for people who get it already, who already have an instinctive sense of fairness and justice and, and defense of human rights, along with a deep concern for the environment, along with a suspicion that uh, monetary and economic systems uh, as the modern manifestation of deeper systems around patriarchy, for example, people who have all that already, how they are, um, yeah, I'm seeing a, a confidence in the way that they communicate, either in articles or on social media, using some of the terminology and ideas in my book. Um, I'll give you one example. Matthew Slater, who was a colleague with me in the Deep Adaptation Forum, has just written an article on lowimpact.org. Uh, and he knows my book because he's the audiobook narrator. So he had to read the whole thing, poor guy, um, closely. And, uh, uh, but yeah, the, I, his, um, 
most recent article, I think, came out just yesterday, uh, critiquing the rise of green authoritarianism in the British environmental movement. Um, there's a lucidity there and a sense that this needs to be said. We need to invite people to a more bottom-up environmentalism rather than a top-down one. Um, so I'm, I'm pleased with that. I don't see this as a book which is likely to be a bestseller. As you said, Katie, it's, it's pretty heavy going. It's a long book. So what I'm looking for is like more people to really get a sense of, wow, okay, yeah, this affirms what I thought I knew. It puts it all together in one framework, in one place, and they're going to go for it. And I'm, and I am, I'm hearing that from, you know, people, as I mentioned, Stu, uh, Stu Basden, Gail Bradbrook, and other people who've been key in the contemporary environment, uh, British environmental movement. I hope this book has an impact beyond that. Um, perhaps even beyond environmentalism, um, because so many people who haven't been involved in environmentalism are waking up to the severity of the climate crisis, but they're also a, a bit spooked with the nature of the COVID, the, the mainstream COVID response. And so they are seeing these concerns grow that we might see an authoritarian response dominating for climate change. This shows that you can be an environmentalist in a different way. And so I hope it reaches some of those people too. Yeah, thank you. I get the impression, I got the impression as I've, I've been reading it, that there's like there's genuine fear in you around the emergent um, authoritarian or proto-fascist responses. Um, like, it feels like a kind of call to action or uh yeah is that is that right is that part of your motivation um yes there is a genuine fear in me um as as the response to covid seemed to be quite authoritarian uh and the even just discussing what may or may not work seem to be demonized or or hidden um i did worry that people might become alienated for, from messages uh about what about public threats um i did worry therefore there might actually as a result of that be a backlash against environmentalism per se and we certainly are seeing that and that was very predictable and it was why i was pained to not see more environmental leaders and top commentators speak out about, well, maybe we need to check what the science is rather than just accept what the pharmaceutical com companies say the science is. And uh, we need to look at more holistic responses, proportionate responses. We need to keep talking about this rather than just having this sort of rather weird polarization. Um, so yes, there is fear in me because possibly because of the COVID period and this sense of intense polarization over the last few years. I've personally experienced a lot of people who've been quite vitriolic towards me, who've sort of uh, been both in private and in public. Um, so yes, I do worry that as panic grows, as anxiety grows about real problems in the world, the environmental crisis and the climate crisis, being front and centre, but also all sorts of you know problems with poverty and, and um, as anxiety grows, uh, people can can be open to manipulation, to the very simple kind of there to blame. And so I, I talked about that in my my speech when I launched the book in Glastonbury that that we seem to have on the one hand a real ecological crisis and on the other hand a sort of a fake green globalist response, and a lot of people are just screaming. In, in, in either of those two directions, like crisis, ah, or fake green globalists, ah, and my book is inviting people to move through that and beyond that kind of emotion of just blame and hatred and, and, and actually, well, let's, can we, can we, um, find something more constructive to do together? And I call that a freedom loving response to collapse and very deliberately. So I, I recognize some people would be alienated with that from that subtitle because um, over the last 40 years, freedom has been sort of assumed to be somehow the preserve of the right. Um, but that's a particular affliction of the in the West. I mean, if, in countries where they've more recently shaken off colonial power and still struggle against colonial power, no one thinks that freedom is just about consumer behavior. Uh, you know, I, I care about me and not about my neighbor. That's just a, a nonsense that's emerged uh, in the West through neoliberalism in the last uh, few decades. 
Thank you. I want to I want to join some dots before I do. I want to send give a reminder to uh, people here that you can submit. You can send in um, if you have a question that you'd like to ask Jem. You can send a direct message to uh, Stuart. Um, yes, please do. Yeah. It'd be good to hear from you. I'm, I'm very happy. We've had what 85, 85 on this on this uh, Q and A today. So I, I do hope we get to hear from some of you. Thank you. Um, yes, and I wanted to connect with what you were saying with about um, the response to in that you're proposing in this new book as a um, kind of an ant- antidote to the the effect of growing fear um, and the you know how it how it's bringing about increasing polarization and um, and the kind of yeah the the global trauma effect of the pandemic and we're you know we it's it's we're going to see more of similar kind of uh collective trauma events and yeah nadine andrews is here we spoke to nadine maybe a couple of years ago about the uh trauma in the context of adaptation to climate chaos um your approach or the approach that mainly you you put forward in in the deep adaptation in deep adaptation and in the forum has been maybe we could generalize the saying it's about exploring methods of co co regulation through connection and community. And I'm curious about the extent to which this book is a development of, or a departure from that approach in deep adaptation. Yeah, I do see that as the most, um, important part of the deep adaptation paper message and community and it is the most important part because that's the bit that people picked up on and really went with um and it's also what i needed at the time um i was also i think in a bit of an emotional mess with uh all my old stories of self and the future and professional identity all being mixed up messed up and so and I had a, a, a real desire to um, serve that moment, help connect people, provide a framework for dialogue and invite people to realise that rushing to have some kind of answer to this, whether that's a technological fi- fi- fix or a bunch of people to blame, that's not actually, that, that's all just emotional aversion. That's that's not staying with the pain. Um, so... So yes, I'm I'm happy with that characterization. However, I always thought that that we might see a lot more in terms of a, an emerging political agenda around this from people who are collapse aware or collapse accepting, and that's been slower to emerge. And also, I realised that um, um, the the political scene is dominated by um, messaging through mass media and through by politicians, and therefore. I noticed that quite a lot of people, despite being very active in this co-regulation thing, were still, I thought, sometimes um, saying things which I thought were politically unhelpful. And I thought, well, rather than rather than just wait for a political philosophy to emerge, kind of like a, a, a politics of compassion, solidarity, and fairness and equality to emerge for an agenda or an era of collapse rather than an era of assumed progress, rather than just waiting for that to emerge, I'd have a go, you know, okay. <laughs> like, I, I think I, I got something to say on this. And I I think I had to let go of the idea that I have to somehow be neutral on this. And, and I just said, these are my ideas. Um, take them or leave them. This is my contribution to a, a collapse-ready politics. Um, so it's... I like to think that it's not coming from any emotional aversion in me. I like to think that it's what I've gained from the whole deep adaptation way of being and the people I know in that field has helped me then do this next thing, which is more explicitly political. Um, I often talk, uh, uh, when someone asks me, I often about the difference between the DA stuff and the book, So, because it is a question that comes up. I say, well, perhaps the DA stuff was quite yin, and this book is a bit more yang um, in terms of how I'm relating to the situation. 
Thank you. Uh, there are a couple of people here from um, who are in the, the deep adaptation community, and uh, I'm going to go to a couple of them who have questions for you. But before we do, I have another question, which is, um, uh, yeah, the, the book covers so many different topics uh, from banking to spirituality to mutual aid, uh, politics, if which of the chapters do you think people most need to read and why? Yeah, thanks. So it depends where people are coming from. I often say that uh, um, it's funny, isn't it? I've been talking about this damn book for two months now, but not in a not in a an event like this. I'm just realizing I'm talking to lots of people about the book. So I'm often saying, well, the book, the first half, is marshalling the evidence for the argument that. Um, the collapse of modern industrial consumer societies uh, has already begun. It can't be changed. Uh, we can talk about reducing harm, and that's very important to do. Um, and the second half of the book is then, so why did this happen and what to do about it, and also what not to do about it, and what we might be able to resist. Um, okay, so if you doubt the premise, then we get stuck into the first half where I talk about the breakdown in economic systems, monetary systems, energy systems, food systems, uh, the biosphere, and then also climate as an accelerator of all that, as well as being a problem in itself. Um, and then there's a chapter talking about the various different cracks in various different aspects of society more on the surface, um, reflecting lots of opinion polls about how now people are thinking about government and capitalism and so on. But if, yeah, if you already accept that premise, then, okay, for those of you who may be feeling kind of ashamed to be part of the human race, so that's quite a thing that crops up with people who are a bit doomy, um, um, and that you have days where you're feeling a bit misanthropic, like, ah, oh, good riddance to the human race, planet Earth will be, be best without us, then I recommend chapters nine and ten because chapter nine i look at how for many millennia human societies that were very complex but complex in different ways not only lived uh, sustainably and in harmony with nature but were actually essential to the biodiversity so for example the various different civilizations we're now beginning to learn about that lived in the amazon and made the amazon what it is today but i give lots of examples and so basically no it's not that homo sapiens didn't belong here we do belong here it's just a particular uh a particular ideology culture and then set of economic systems which then took that to extremes i particularly focus on the monetary system which is chapter 10 and i show how it took um very alienated and alienating stories of reality and of humans within that reality, took those and made them extreme and took away our freedom to live and think, to think and live differently. And so I talk about the unfreedom that comes from that monetary system. Um, so I would recommend chapters nine and 10, and then it can be like, okay, so, you know, Homo sapiens as a species, um, it wasn't inevitable that this happened. A lot of people will therefore feel a bit upset with that. Um, I know a lot of people don't want to think like that because then they worry they might feel some guilt and some shame, or they may go into just sort of an angry blame mode against uh, the, the richest people in the world. Well, drop all that. Just drop all those fears of blame and guilt and or whatever. Just drop it all and just, just uh, allow yourself to consider this information and then just find a way of living where you're not driven by any of the either aversion to guilt and shame or, or attraction to blaming others. The other chapter then um, that I think is really important is chapter eight on something which I'm summarizing with the phrase critical wisdom or the, the, the new term critical wisdom. And that's because I think that um, we need to help each other to be wise in this moment. And for me, that involves a blend of lots of different things and lots of different ways of being and knowing. So mindfulness, obviously, so we become aware of how our cravings and aversions to different emotions are actually involved in the micro moments of how we perceive the world and what we think is a true claim or not, or what's right or wrong. So to cultivate some mindfulness, and there's many ways to do that. Um, 
Uh, secondly, something I'm calling critical literacy, but also that's a term in sociology, uh, where we become aware of how power works in shaping uh, concepts and narratives and stories in society and how that then reproduces that power. And then unless we're conscious of that, we end up just being so easily manipulated. Obviously, some sociologists say that's an impossible thing. We'll never escape that. We're actually constituted by that discursal power. But I think still we should try and cultivate awareness of it to avoid manipulation increasing at this time. Um, and then there's... Um, rationality a lot of people take i think perhaps you know i live in in in, in a in a community in a, i live in a town where a lot of people might take um those two things so far where they drop all interest in logic um and so i think it's very important to be aware of logical uh logical fallacies uh and understand rationality i'm certainly not um i'm building from science with a critical eye rather than negating it so i'm i'm quite uh and quite, I, I quite like rationality and logic. And then the fourth thing is uh, intuition. So there's all manner of ways of knowing the world, other than not only through through language and 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 maths and so on, but also and not even through our brains, but through um, and it may even not even be through our bodies. So um, I encourage people, if you've no, never had it before, to immerse yourself in nature, to consider things like fasting, to consider things like microdosing, to consider things like extended periods of meditation, not just for mindfulness, but for transcendent states, uh, and not to negate that or, or think that, poo-poo that, but actually recognize that as one of the four pillars of the kind of cultivating wisdom in these times. That's chapter eight. Thank you. Uh, yeah, comprehensive there and there is um we've got a question coming up later about um the uh let me just find i'm going to come to uh natalie not straight away but a question about the specifics and this is the research um the first half of the book which is your research so we'll, we'll come to that shortly um first i would like to invite um Kimberly, welcome Kimberly. If you're still here, will you unmute yourself and um ask your question to Jem? It's good to see you. Yeah, uh, good to see you too. Hi, Jem. <clears throat> um okay. yeah, so I, I had an original question and it's kind of slightly evolved since since you've been talking. Um it was I mean, I love the book. Thank you so much. It's brilliant. Um and I love the breaking together angle. Um, and the emphasis on we rather than I. And there's still a feeling and a sense in the book for me um, about naming the enemy in terms of other humans. <laughs> and uh, and I wonder if if you feel we can ever achieve a kind of pro-life, any kind of pro-life uh, future um, if we continue to perceive other humans as bad or wicked, rather than the compassion, which you know you've you've taught me so much about the love and the compassion required to understand that it's a kind of bad and wicked system rather than bad and wicked people, and I'm so struck recently by the uh, my own shift uh, towards away from the individual and towards, you know, uh, we, towards what we can do together. Yeah, so I just wondered what you what you thought about that, that, yeah, that this sense in which um, if we just changed these individual people, do you know what I mean? Yes, thank you, Kim. And I just want to say that I, I see some people are sending messages messages into the general chat or even i think maybe messaging me i i, I won't see those so if you want to uh, ask a question send it to directly to stuart smith um so find him and do that um thank you so yeah kim um it's it's uh so i'm a professor of leadership and one of the most famous studies in the 80s on leadership was how um when things are going particularly well or particularly badly, uh, across cultures, psych uh, psychologists' studies find that we uh, 
if things are going better or worse than expected than the norm, uh, we tend to blame or praise the senior role holder, the person with power we perceive, uh, w- even if we have absolutely no evidence for that. Um, and it's just the fact that the, the, the how psychology works. Um, and so when we see things going badly now, yeah, it's a lot easier to say, get super angry at the chairman of the World Economic Forum uh, and say, you know, Klaus Schwab must be an evil man who's in charge of the planet working with Bill Gates, uh, rather than look at the complex systems which are destroying the planet. Uh, and therefore, if, you know, what was it, Klaus Schwab is, must be about 90 now, he might be, he might, be, he might even die tomorrow. Nothing's going to change. Yeah, Bill Gates could, you know, slip up and bang his head and 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 never never give a grant or a speech again, and nothing would change. So this is this is key. We need to definitely look at the systems rather than get so fixated on 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 individuals. And but there is this tendency. It's a lot easier. It also it works in a way where um, we don't then look at our own complicity in those systems. And so I talked about that in my launch speech um, when I I look back on my own career and I spent prior to 2017, so 22 years of my career in sustainability, I spent the whole time basically looking up the tree, looking up the hierarchy, uh, uh, who has power, where's the power, how can I get their ear, how can I be their confidant, how I can get them to do the right things, thinking that was the most responsible thing to do. and actually, I, I realized that um, we make so many compromises about our own uh, curiosity and our own sense of what's reality in doing that. And we stop looking at each other and we stop thinking about our, you know, how to team up with our neighbors or, or, or those around us. And so I'm, yeah, I'm, for me, that's quite a big, big, big message in the book. I want to, actually, I'm going to hold it up here. So. You see, if you get the real one, it's so today you can download for free the EPUB. Just go to jenbendel.com and there you go, you download it for free. But it's far nicer to hold it because it's got this beautiful piece of art, which I did with Dorinka Montico. Now, there's a reason for this, which relates to your question. So this is the Farnes Atlas, um, who's a, a, a titan god. and and um, But it's it's been kintsugi'd. So kintsugi is the ancient Japanese art of when something breaks... Um, you stick it back together again with gold, and but you're not you're not thinking you can use it for what it once was. So when you you know you have a, an antique mug which you love dearly and you were using for to drink green tea for for in your family for a century, and you break it, when you stick it back together again, you're not going to use it for that. It's just going to be an ornament, but it reminds you of your not only the object and what it was used for, but it reminds you of your love for that but recognizing that it's broken. So I've done that here because the the myth of Atlas has, the, the true meaning of it has been lost um, over time, where people think this is the planet when it's not, it's the, 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 the heavens, the universe in general. And people have lost the idea that, that Zeus cursed um, Atlas with the idea that he had to hold up the heavens to stop them collapsing. And so it was Atlas, what what a lovely, Atlas represents an aspect of our our humanity. It's wonderful that we care and we don't want our family and the rest of humanity to to die under collapsing heavens. Um, But it's also pure hubris and self-obsession that we think that we have to do that. And so there's a paradox. It's good that we care about people and, and the world beyond ourselves, but also there's a paradox in that that it can go horribly wrong. So we don't resolve that paradox. You don't resolve that paradox by saying, oh, let's everyone be entirely free of only so, any social consideration. Or or um, you don't resolve the paradox by just hoping that some um, superhuman ethical dictator can fix it and tell us what, or what to do for our own good. You just have to recognize that this is a paradox of, of human nature. So um, that's why it's on the cover. Um, we're going to still let, let's keep caring for each other and the world and the heavens and all sorts, but also recognize how that could go terribly wrong because it always does go terribly wrong. So that also connects back, Katie, to when I talked about my concern about green authoritarianism and inviting a different approach. Mm, thank you. Thanks, Kimberly. Good to see you, Annette. Are you still here? I'm still here, Katie. Um, lucky third. Um, 
Hi, it's lovely to see you. And hi, Jim. Um, I asked this question in Glastonbury and felt that I didn't really get an answer to it because Gail responded by saying, oh, that's what I'm talking about in my talk. And then, and then she gave a great talk, but I don't feel she really covered this, which is um, it's related to uh, the one disappointment of the day was that Stephen Wright wasn't there. I really looked forward to hearing from him. I had been to meet him um, at his place in Cumbria, and we talked about all of this and the idea of um, addressing the cause beneath the cause of really trying to help support people reconnecting to source or God or the divine, however you want to name it. Um, yeah, so I'm wondering what's your take on, on that, the kind of spiritual aspect of all this, um, as well as what would you have hoped that he would have said if it's not really your thing? Um, what would you have hoped he'd have had to say about that? Thank you. Mm. Well, I just would have hoped that Stephen would have been Stephen and we could have all just luxuriated in his compelling mysticism. But um, yeah. he, one of his, well, his closest colleague and friend uh, had a, a personal tragedy just two days before that event. And so he went to be with her. Right. Um, yeah, I, I um, uh, actually, Stephen Wright has finished the first draft of a whole book on deep adaptation and spirituality. So uh, there's that to come. And, um, but I'll answer for, for myself. Um, I'm not, I'm not going to take you up on what would I want him to say or, or anything. Okay. Like that. that's, that's, that's fine. Myself. That's fine. You know, I'd love um, to. yeah. Uh, um, uh, back to the paradox. Um, If, if in, if from um, twenty fifteen to twenty seventeen, uh, if from twenty fifteen to twenty sixteen, I hadn't been paying attention to the latest climate news and data, and become extremely worried, so worried I needed to take a year out from university to study the climate science again for myself, rather than just assuming what IPCC said was was correct. Um, if I hadn't done that, I wouldn't have had my dark night of the soul. And I wouldn't be who I am today. Um, and I therefore probably would have been still a corporate sustainability workaholic, still working from the idea that it's good to get people to do the right thing for the wrong reasons. And uh, one just has to keep pretending and behaving according to what's expected of me as a as a as someone um, who's a, a high-ranking professional successful guy. Um, so the weird thing is, is that me, me, yeah, coming to that, uh, awareness, not just of my own mortality. It's kind of like multi-dimensional mortality. So it's the extent of the loss of other life and species, the extent of suffering of humans now, the extent of how much is to come, the you know the, the biological annihilation which is already beginning, which is going to continue. That we can't do anything much about um, the very possibility the possibility of human extinction caused by ourselves. All of this was. Um, yeah, it was, was, was huge for me and um, melted my or fractured my old stories of self and identity. Um, it even revealed to me that I was operating from a, a, a story of self where I need to have self-worth and I get self-worth by being a smart guy who cares and works hard. And it, it smashed all of that. And what was I left with? I was left with um, something else, which is, and, and and many spiritual teachers talk about that, where you you have that disintegration of self, and then what you, you what are you? Your your consciousness, um, your part of you're just a a bit of something infinite, um, and uh, and there's a, a core truth of just being loving. And, and curious. Um, that was what was dominant, dominated for me, being loving and being curious. So, um, so it's a paradox because would I have wanted everything to be fine in the world or for me to not have known about it? Like, you know, so many of the people in the world, most people in the world perhaps, don't know about this stuff and don't face it. Um, it's, it's, it's a weird one because... 
Because I think liberation can come through facing this reality and let it change you. Um, and lots of people talk about that too. And I talk about it in chapter 12 of the book. I talk about a few people where it really did um, change them in that way. And they would frame, they would describe it in terms of it uh, being a, an awakening moment. So the spiritual thing being quite big for them. I talk about mm -hmm. Zori uh, in, in chapter 12, for example, where it was crucial in, in her evolution. Um, reading the Thank you. I, I haven't got that far yet, so I'll, I'll make sure to get there. Thank you, Jem. That was, I found that. So that's moving to do that. Thank you. Yeah. And um, the, as I'm listening to you speaking, Jem, then what I noticed is the, the energy shifting uh from like it's possible to engage in this topic in a in a cognitive way we're talking about ah chapter 12 on this and chapter 7 on this and how it's impacting and what people can do and then um yeah dropping down into the the more personal like remembering this is real and every single one of the 89 people here today are, are we're holding it in our hearts and in our um, in bodies in different and challenging ways um, and in a few minutes we're going to um, pause with the Q&A and, uh, and go into breakout rooms to, to share, connect in a kind of more intimate way um, and share a little bit but before we do that uh, Jessica's back. Jessica let's see if, uh, if the weather at your end is going to let us hear your question. Thank you, Katie. Um, thank you, Jem, for your book and for creating the space for us to discuss um, these critical ideas. Um, and I, yes, I'm in the Caribbean, so it's windy hurricane season, so I might lose connection. Um, in your chapters, um, I found them really uh, obviously critical, but the one that was seemed to be missing for me was one on education and uh, especially education in the global north. Um, I have a 19-year-old daughter who's going to be uh, attending her first year of university at uh, University of British Columbia. She's chosen to be in the north. And um, I wanted to know your thoughts, maybe two or three points on what you think that um, post-secondary school institutions should be doing to equip our young people to meet these uh, unbelievable challenges and this very uncertain um, and worsening future? And, and do you feel um, in your heart of hearts that these institutions are even capable of uh, supporting and uh, meeting the needs of young people? So anything you have on that would be great. Thank you. Yeah, wow. 19, you said. Yeah, so... Um, yeah, the Deep Adaptation Edited book had a chapter on education, and you're right, I don't talk about it um, um, in this book, um, I don't really get specific about any real, I don't get specific about policy areas, more it's political philosophy rather than that. I, I am, um, well, there's two ways of going. One is live life to the max, and that's different for whoever else, whoever it is. So your 19 year old, Living life to the max might be, you know, if she's passionate about a certain subject and wants to go to a certain place in the world and have that experience, then great. But I think it will do nothing to help her. Um, I, I'm not a parent. And if I was, I'd be, I'd be choosing a very different, uh, I'd be encouraging my, uh, child because it depends on what age. Um, but to, 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 to buck the traditional education system entirely. Um, because, yeah, you talked about in my heart of hearts. No, I, I, I think um, there's there's a few schools, some forest schools and stuff where they're very focused on not training people just to be little hard workers in industrial systems and, you know, tidy consumers. Um, but I want wild revolutionaries in the world, and that's what young people are, and let's help them be that way in constructive ways. Um, and so, yeah, people should be, um, all of us actually, every one of us here, as I, I talk about it as a great reclamation of our power from the systems of imperial modernity. So um, I popped that guitar there. It was actually slightly further out of view. I just put it in there. And it's because, and the T-shirt I had made, it says, you know, doomsters, we... 
we grow our own food, we make our own music, we use our own currencies, and we have more fun. And it, it's, there's all manner of ways we can reclaim our lives, aspects of our lives from imperial modernity, which also therefore means let's make our own music. Um, let's let's uh, look at all ways that we can be have fun and be productive together outside of industrial consumer society. I, the, the vast majority, perhaps all of it, education is, is, is training people up to uh, uh, for salaried labor within industrial consumer societies. So um, I reject it all now. And I guess I'm saying that because today marks the day where my line manager wrote back telling me that my, uh, my leaving the university has been confirmed. So I'm leaving academia. Um, so a professorship should be for life, and I'm, I'm, I'm quitting. I'm going to focus on writing music and uh, uh, developing my organic farm school and um, other sorts of stuff. So I'm, I'm not just saying this. I've, I've had it with <laughs> a lot of um, uh, academia. So I don't know what you should do. I uh, say to you, uh, is, is maybe your nineteen-year-old might be interested in my book. <laughs> well, well, thank you, Jim. And she uh, she actually read um, the collapsologist. Um, Another end of the world is possible. She took that oh, yeah. on her trip to Costa Rica, um, and she grew up in the rainforest in the Caribbean. So now she wants to try to see what uh, <laughs> what the North is like, yeah. and I. I want her to experiment and to be free to make choices after that too. Yeah, so <laughs> I totally understand, and that—that's what I was saying. Is live like living life to the max as people feel it at, the, at that time, and that's where she's at. So good luck. Thank you. Thank you for that. Yeah, so that's uh, like beautifully connects with uh, the invitation that I want to, yeah, that offer you right now. Are you gonna? Um, just actually it's a thought experiment maybe for maybe for fun um listening to to jessica talk about her daughter listen to jem talk about kind of what one aspect of freedom uh means and so you're going to be in a in a breakout room with um two other people most most of it is going to be you might find yourself with three other people and um this is the question i'm offering you if you knew that you had a year of life left. What would you be doing? So it's a thought experiment. You know, we can assume that these 12 months are not going to include a long and increasingly debilitating illness. You have, you have 20, 12 months left. All the people watching this on YouTube are going to miss out on everything we're reading here, aren't they? They are. To relax into love to experience nature, caring for the earth, connection, love and care. Some playing and fun. Leaving a viral legacy of love for humans in the more than human world. So, yeah. Um, I actually, I know this isn't, you're the host, but I just want to, <laughs> I want to say something. Is that... Um, it's just reminding me of, of there are rare conversations which are deeply meaningful, nourishing, and can help resource us with the, these difficult times. I don't have it much in my life because I've been busy, so stupidly busy for the past year writing a book. But um, I found these sorts of things happening in the Deep Adaptation Forum. Um, so I know lots of good, lovely stuff happens there online as well, in increasingly again in person. So for those of you who don't know about it, check it out. Deepadaptation.info. Thanks, Jem. Um, we're a little bit past the top of the hour, so I'd like to say thank you to each of you for showing up, um, joining joining this event. Uh, also, thanks to each of you for showing up in all of the other ways um, in your life, in your work on this topic. Jem, thank you for... Yeah, your huge generosity. I know that not everything that you do on this topic in this work is uh, joyful for you. And yeah, I'm I'm really grateful. And I know I'm that that thank you is on behalf of a lot of people, people who are here, and also people who haven't been able to join us today. Um, the uh, 
recording of this Q and A will be on Gem's YouTube channel. Gem, where can people um, get a copy of your book, um, including the paid for copy? Um, if people can afford to buy a copy, then uh, yeah, there's is- a there's a there's a pinned uh, post on gembendel.com, which then links to. UK paperback direct from the publisher, Schumacher, uh, as well as um, Amazon paperback and Amazon hardback and also the audio book for for purchasing. But also if you go to SoundCloud and type Jen Bendel, then you'll arrive at my SoundCloud account and there's about six of the chapters audio uh, for free and... About every two to three weeks, I'll write a blog and I'll release another chapter audio there until they're all out. So that's another way of consuming it in chunks. But yeah, the free EPUB, it's there today. Jembendel.com, you'll see a link uh, that to download it. I have it on your e-reader. Please tell people about it. It's, uh, yeah, it, I, uh, people are telling me this, this can be life-changing. Um, by helping in personal transformations. So, and it's not something that will necessarily get written about in mass media other than to slag it off because it's too frightening. Um, a political scientist uh, I know told me, Jem, what you're doing is probably the most counter hegemonic thing. Didn't even know I pronounced that right. Is it counter hegemonic, hegemonic, I don't know, thing that he knew. There you go, from a political scientist. Shakes things up a bit. And so yeah. it should. This society, this this culture became suicidal, didn't it? So uh, we're waking up to that. Thank you. Jembendel.com. You won't get a follow-up email from this event, so please do take some mm-hmm. time to, to have a look at the link yourself. And um, until next time, thank you so much. Thank you, Jem. Thanks, Stuart, for your support.